Hi everybody, my name is Leonie Jabe, and I'll be speaking to you today about handling hard to handle kids. I've had to pre-record my video because my Wi-Fi is really not so great here, but this is the second lecture that I'm doing for BBGR about pediatrics, so hopefully you have fun and learn something. Well, welcome to level two. Who would have thought, like day 145, month five, I don't know what day it is, no one knows what's going on anymore. But anyway, we have unlocked friends and family and interprovincial travel and gyms and restaurants and alcohol and smoking. Wow, it's really crazy. But who knows how long it's going to last before they just take it away again. So enjoy it while it lasts. At the moment, Uncle Cyril is acting a little bit like a sort of a grumpy mother going like, do whatever you want, I don't care anymore. Anyway, guys, just stay safe out there, and I hope you're hanging in there. It's been really, really tough in the practices, I know. Um, we've had to adapt, and it's, it's difficult. So, well done for hanging in there. I hope everybody's okay, and I'm available on sort of the chat box if you want to chat. So, leave me a message, or otherwise, you're more than welcome to email me after the fact. So, at iacle at iafrica.com, I-A-C-L-E at iafrica.com and I'll be happy to help out with any questions. But let's get to it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop my video just to try and save a little bit of um, bandwidth. And then I'm gonna share my screen with you so that hopefully you can get to see everything I'm seeing. And we'll take it from there. And we'll do the slideshow. So yay, okay. So let's look at this, handling hard to handle kids. But before we carry on with that, I just want to talk about how we deal with the situation of COVID in the practice. So we all have to mask up, we all have to pr protect ourselves, protect our patients, do what we can to prevent the spread of it. So first thing first, make sure you guys look after yourselves, your staff and your patients and stay safe. So mask up, do whatever you have to do, shields, instrument shields. It's very difficult, I must be very honest with you, for me to um, see patients with a mask on, but especially pediatric patients, but you have to just do what you have to do. Because I find that I lose a lot of information from vision, just vision wise, just looking at a child and getting that info. And I mean, there's a lot of communication that happens visually rather than just auditory so i know it's difficult and especially with these kids special needs kids it's going to be tough that a lot of them don't like wearing the masks so it's going to be your call but you have to be a little bit careful also specifically the down syndrome kids i find are very affectionate and they always want to hug and they're very friendly and all that kind of stuff so you're going to have to see how you how you're going to handle that one but be that as it may stay safe out there. So who are these kids that we're speaking about? I'm going to be covering these following areas, ADHD and SPD, ASD, special needs, precocious and really just naughty kids. But let's, uh, let's just discuss why they are so difficult, because they are a challenge. They're not like normal kind of, well, are there any normal children? But they're not like ch children that don't have these, dis this, this, these disorders, sorry. They have problems in terms of their ability to process information. And it's usually related to some kind of neurological functioning, condition, damage, disorder, whatever you want to call it. And they have a really, really tough time reading social and environmental cues. So that is an issue. And it can be very overwhelming to them to be in a practice and can cause major breakdown and anxiety and they'll throw tantrums and go crazy. So Remember that these kids might not be able to complete the examinations like you would normally do in a, in a short kind of space of time. So don't be afraid to really stop the examination if it starts going pear-shaped and reschedule them. Because sometimes they just can't handle it all in one go. And that's fine. Just explain that to the parents before you start. Okay. So... The issue with handling these children has got to do a lot with making the environment that they're finding themselves in, which is really not comfortable for them, a little bit more predictable. Remember, sometimes they've never had an eye test done before. Um, it's, a, it's a strange 
new environment, there are weird things there that look a bit scary. But if you can give them some kind of predictability, it will really help make your life a little bit easier. So demonstrate what you're going to do next. Or if you do have another sibling or a parent there, sometimes it helps to let them have the test done first. But when all else fails, you can try and bribe them. So I've got sweeties, just make sure that the parents are okay with it. I have little toys that they can get to play with. Once again, it's an issue now because we have to disinfect everything. Um, but yeah, so bribery when all else fails. So let's speak about ADHD first, my favorite topic, since I also have ADHD and it is a challenge. But you can spot these kids, right? You turn your back for a second and the next thing the child is jumping up and down and literally swinging from his thumb. We've had that at the practice before. Or you walk out and they're walking along the reception desk and trying to jump on the frame rack. But you can spot them. And there are a bit of a challenge. Things have changed slightly in that the DSM-4 or DSM-5 now classification of ADHD has been amended. Before it used to be have it used to have to be diagnosed before the age of seven, but they have changed that now so that the onset has to be before the age of 12. So before that, it used to be the age of seven. A couple of different things. It's a very important thing. ADHD can only be diagnosed by a pediatrician, a pediatric psychiatrist, a psychiatrist, a neurologist, um, pediatric psychologist, not Karen on Facebook, okay? So you can't have, for example, the teacher saying, oh no, your child has got ADHD, and then go off to the GP and just get medication. There are very specific criteria to adhere to to get to a diagnosis. So I'm going to go through some of those things with you. But there are five main areas of ADHD signs. And within those five areas, there are numerous other little sub signs. So any of the five signs, or any of the five signs, but five of them over six months seen by at least three people will give you the ADHD diagnosis. So what I'm trying to say is there are five main areas or signs of ADHD and under each of those five signs are subsets. So any of those subsets can lead to the diagnosis of ADHD, but it has to be there for some period of time, at least six months, and at least seen by three people or more. So teacher, a parent, a caregiver, can't just be the teacher that says the child is naughty and then the kid is fine at home or vice versa. So the three types of ADHD, the inattentive type, which is about 20%, these are mainly the ADD, so attention deficit disorders, more girls than boys, and these kids often fall through the cracks because they're easily missed because they're so quiet. They will sit there and daydream and look out the window, the butterfly flying past or whatever it is. So they are just not paying attention. So they're overlooked a lot. And unfortunately, there's a high risk of um, suicide, especially in the teenage years in these kids, and also very high incidence of depression in these children. So watch out for them because they're going to be missed. Then you get, or most of them are combined types, but then you get the hyperactive ones. And those are the crazy, crazy kiddies in terms of the, their behavior and what they do. So although they're the smallest part of um, or subset of ADHD children, they are certainly the ones that leave the most lasting impression, right? So let's have a look at that. These are the five areas that I spoke to you about. And I'm going to go through each of them briefly. So I'm going to give you the subsets within each one. Remember, any five of those signs under any of these five main areas can lead to a diagnosis for ADHD. All right. So it doesn't have to be all of these five that get shown, but five symptoms across or signs across the board will go through them. So let's start with impaired attention. Um, these children, you know, they don't really listen and they don't think about what it is they're doing. So they will be the ones that are looking off. They can't follow instructions at all. So let's say, for example, we have this little noodle here. Um, doesn't finish, they don't finish their work. So here's Theo and writing his maths test, okay? 
Clothea started off quite well, no problem, blah, blah, blah. And then come this question three sort of over here, he's just stopped. Now he's drawing a car and a spider's walking across the page and there's a speedboat, don't know what this is. This looks like a bit of a horse. I don't know what is flying here. It's a bit scary. So uh, yeah, so this is the kind of thing they, they will do. They'll start off okay, and then they just lose interest and off they go on their own little mission. Yes, so that is exactly what happens here. They uh, don't listen to instructions very well. Okay, they don't do detail very well. So here what happens is that the um, kid has been asked to draw a person. And so they start off with the head or nice thing. They're like, ah, okay, that's boring. And they just added some legs somewhere through the head and I mean, yeah, legs to the head, arms to the head. They don't attend to detail. That is one of the main, main things that you're gonna find with these children. They don't follow instructions well. So this was a child who's supposed to write a letter as per their example. Started off okay, but not quite, you know. At the end of the day here, yeah, they're sort of underlining in the middle of the word and yeah, they didn't even write the letter. It's like, okay, that's enough, bored. Yeah, so we'll see. That's the kind of stuff that happens. The other thing that they do is that they perseverate. So they will find something that interests them or is fun for them, and then they'll just carry on doing that. So this once again was a child who has asked to was asked to uh, to draw a child, and um, <laughs> Sorry, I just got distracted. You see what I mean? Okay, um, was asked to draw a child and then found that drawing the hair was really fun. So then they decided to draw hair everywhere. So they draw hair, 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 and they've got like a belly button happening. And this child doesn't, this thing doesn't even have legs. So yeah, perseveration. They'll find something that they find interesting and just keep going. The other thing that these children do before we go off to the um, hyperactivity part is that they don't really sequence well. In other words, you can't give them an instruction like, okay, Johnny, come in, sit down, put your case on your left, take out your crayons and write your name on the top of the page. Because they will put the case down, open it, see the apple, grab the apple, go outside, eat it while chasing the squirrel. You can't do that. So you have to make sure when you give them instructions, they're very, very short and don't sequence it, whether it's auditory or visually. All right, so they don't organize well. And also the other thing with them is that they prefer to work alone. They don't work well in groups and people actually, the other kids don't want them in their, in their little groups usually because they just completely dominate. So they tend to work alone. Right, the hyperactivity part, as I said, is that part where it um, really dominates when it is present. So although it's only about 15% of the ADHD kids, it will really come, show majorly if, if it is there. So watch out for these kids are crazy, right? They will really just be bouncing off the wall and they squirm, they can't sit still. They will run around in the classroom. They'll get up, they go to the teacher, they'll interrupt, they'll just cause chaos. They will literally be climbing the walls and they can't play quietly. They tend to break things, they break things, they talk a lot. And it's like they are on the go all the time. They've got an engine that runs full blast all the time. My nephew, my sister's um, son, has, still has, even though he's an adult now, but he had ADHD when he was a child. And she would say to me, I just wish he had an off switch. I just wish he had an off switch. I could switch him off for five minutes and just have a cup of tea. But no, he was crazy, crazy, crazy. So yeah, those kids go. They are on the go all the time. And they, and they don't sit still. And you'll know all about them. So they will climb up stuff, they will climb into stuff. It always seems like a good idea at the time. The third main sign area in ADHD is disinhibition or impulsiveness. So these kids really just don't think before they do something. So they react very impulsively, impulsively sorry, to a, a, a prom, to a problem. They don't really understand what's going on, but they just go in there. So like the teacher will say, okay, take out your um, scissors and cut the circle out on the page and color it in red. 
And then Johnny has already taken out his scissors, cut the triangles into squares, and is making paper airplanes. So they, they don't understand what they're doing. They don't sequence, they don't listen, and they understand com and they react completely impulsively. So they make very careless mistakes and they get very frustrated very quickly because they know they're not doing it right and it makes them very frustrated. They don't plan well, they don't, ju they don't judge things well, they've got, they really are very bad. So this becomes a major problem when children with ADHD don't outgrow it and carry it into adulthood. These are the people that have really weird harebrained schemes and do strange stuff. So their work is sloppy and they make real approximations of what they should be doing. They sort of do it, but man, they get bored and they, you know, they just give a kind of an idea of what they're trying to do. They're very, very reckless. And yeah, so always seems like a good idea at the time. And then I don't know what the little brother is doing in the background, but none of this looks good. The poor parents, right? So this is just an example of an approximation. So this child was asked to write the date and write a letter to the teacher. So we have at the top here, February, it's supposed to be February. Okay, this kid is also dyslexic, by the way, but you can see it's February, sort of, it's like an approximation of February. I like you, this is Miss, back to front. Please, I don't know what this, how are you, so how are you? What do you love? I know you. I don't know what this child is carrying on about, but at the end, yeah, he's going, I would like to shower, which is a bit weird. But yeah, so approximations of what's going on. And they're very clever, or they take the shortest cut they can to get to where they need to be. So you can see, this is hilarious. I would give this child marks for that. But anyway, yeah, that's where we are. Don't think things through, accident prone, reckless, always a fantastic idea. And yeah, they don't delay, they can't delay their gratification at all. It is a real problem. The one interesting aspect to, to children with ADHD is that they really want feedback immediately. So they are very sensitive to rewards, which can work to your benefits because you can bribe them quite well. So things like star charts work well with these kids. So if you get 10 gold stars for doing whatever it is, you can go and get a toy or whatever they, whatever your bribery is of the, of the moment. But they get completely distressed if they lose those rewards. So that works quite well, but they do want immediate reinforcement. Lastly, they have poor self-esteem. And this is actually quite sad because these ADHD kids are not usually intellectually impaired. They're usually quite bright. And they know they're doing stuff wrong. They know they should be doing things better. They know they are causing trouble and that it's not right. And, you know, the people are getting disappointed and frustrated with them. So it makes them very, um, you know, sensitive and they feel very badly. So they have very bad self-esteem. But what they do then is they try and sort of mask it by being the class clown and being overly, you know, boisterous or whatever it is and having a lot of bravado so a way to help them with this is to praise them for the little things that they get right so little tiny steps praise them as they go along and it's also a good idea if you can encourage participation in extramural mural activities they're not going to do well in team sports i must be honest with you right now they don't play well with others because let's say for example cricket they are not going to do well. It's a team sport. You have to take turns. They can't wait for their turn. So they're going to be like, this side is busy. You're supposed to be bowling, bowling and fielding. And Johnny grabs the bat and he goes on, I'm batting now. I don't care. So those kinds of things don't work well. You need to do stuff where they're on their own. That's where they can get good feedback. So horse riding is quite a nice one. Um, although the one child that I knew that had ADHD almost burnt the stables down, so yeah, there's that. You have to be a little bit careful. But extramural activities give them good feedback. So what happens when you want to see these children in your practice? They have to take their medication when they see you. I cannot tell you how important that is. You know, the people arrive, even though I've told them, please make sure he takes his meds or she takes his med meds on the day of the examination. Oh, but it was a Saturday, blah, blah. No, 
the, there's a very good reason that you want them to be on their ADHD medication, if they are taking some, on the day of examination. Firstly, it's gonna make your life a thousand times easier. But secondly, the ADHD medications have a lot of visual side effects. And you need to pick those up because the child is going to be going to school with the ADHD medication in place and the, these visual side effects are gonna manifest. One of the things that happens is that things like Ritalin, Concerta, anything that's methylphenidate based is going to have an effect on the focusing ability. So it affects the ciliary muscle. So these children are gonna have problems when they're trying to read. They're gonna get very um, frustrated very quickly because they can't read because it's going blurry. They can't man maintain their accommodation for long. So that's why you need to pick those things up when you're doing the exam and you can't do it if they're not on their meds. So it's very important that you explain that to the parents. So take your medication and then we can see you. So you're gonna pick up problems on book rate, on MEM, near stuff, accommodation, flexibility, that kind of stuff. So watch out for that. The other thing is these children get tired in the afternoon and some of the ADHD medication only lasts in the morning. So if they're taking normal Ritalin, by 12 o'clock it's, it's sort of out of their system and you're going to have a child that's going to be either bouncing off the wall or so irritable and tired that they're not going to do it. So see them in the, in the early morning when they've taken the medication. In your consulting room, try and have as few stimulating things as possible and no other children in the room if you can possibly avoid it. They really get distracted very easily. So keep the parents in there with them. They will help you control them and work very quickly. I cannot tell you how important this is. You don't have time, 15 minutes to do retinoscopy. It has to be 30 seconds, under a minute, get it done. But if they are going really crazy and just causing chaos, I often threaten the parents that I'm going to charge for the broken equipment. So, oh, Johnny, so nice that you're swinging on my slit lamp. It's cost 75,000 Rand and I'll be adding that to your bill. So you won't see, believe how quickly those parents jump up and grab that child off there. So watch out for that. Okay. Next kind of, um, or next sort of area I'm going to look at are the children who've got sensory processing disorder. Now you guys know about this kind of disorder. And I'm sure you've heard about it. These children are very, very sensitive to different kind of inputs, sensory inputs. So they don't like noises, lights, crowds, things touching them. And they have weird things like they don't like having their hair washed. They don't like having their teeth brushed or their fingernails cut. It's always a problem. They're very sensitive to loud noises. They're very sensitive to bright lights sometimes. They are picky, picky eaters and they don't touch normally. They don't like being hugged, etc., like that. So they also have this thing called selective hearing. So they'll, because they're so sensitive to sound, it's almost like they cut things out. So they will selectively attend. Sounds a little bit like my husband, but never mind. That's another story for another day. Um, so they won't listen because they're concentrating on one thing. They have poor motor skills, so they're quite clumsy and they don't like walking barefoot. So especially on things like grass. So these kids are these babies that will literally lift their legs up when you try and put them on down on grass. They often walk on their tiptoes to just avoid that kind of sensory input. And they're very sensitive to like things like clothing tags. So if you've got those tags inside your clothes, I don't know about you guys, but I hate those tags. I cut them off all the time. So that freaks me out. But, you know, it does not, doesn't necessarily mean I have, you know, sensory processing disorder. Or maybe I do. But the other thing is with these kids, although they, they're quite strange in terms of being picky eaters and, and averse to stuff, they, they will gag at, at smells. It'll make them want to, to throw up. They do walk around sniffing stuff, which is a bit odd. So they smell people and they smell objects. And then the other thing is they like chewing on things, random things. It's a bit weird and a bit strange. So yeah, um, I think there might be some American politicians like this, I'm just saying. Anywho, um, you'll, you'll pick these kids up. They will, they will, parents will know all about it. So watch out for them, because you can imagine if they are very sensitive to sights and sounds, being in an optometric office is going to be quite a challenge for them. There's bright lights, it's a new place, it's not usually very noisy. 
But when you are handling these children, try and speak very slowly and be less verbal. So don't give them stacked questions. Don't repeat yourself. So for example, don't say, oh, hello, Johnny, sit down, read the bottom line. Okay, there you go, read it, read it, you know, and, and really push them. Just scale it down a little bit, calm it down, soft voice, give them time to respond. Don't repeat yourself and try and keep the, the environment, you know, quiet. Um, not too many bright lights, not too noisy. Watch for the children's anxiety levels. You pick up on it quite easy. They do this weird thing where they start flicking their fingers. So they'll flick their fingers, um, they bang stuff, or they'll, or they'll hit their hands on the, on the side of the chair or kick their feet. So they will make these pervasive kind of movements and you'll pick that up. It helps to add predictability. So once again, if you can go through the procedure with another sibling or parent, if they are coming for a test, that it does help. With these children not liking stuff on them, to touch them, specs and frames are ill tolerated by them. They don't like these things on their faces, they'll pull them off. So contact lenses might be an option, but once again, you and I both know that contact lenses can be a little bit uncomfortable. So you're going to have to decide how, um, how to handle that and what to do. It, it is a bit of a challenge. Next group of kids are or the kids on the autism spectrum disorder. So what has happened here is that the DSM classification for autism has changed as well. So when we're looking at autism spectrum disorder, what happens here is that there's no longer different classifications for this spectrum under the DSM-5. They've all been grouped together. So it's now a single disorder, which ranges, ranges in severity from mild, like somebody with Asperger's, to very severe, somebody with bad autism that's completely non-verbal and self-harming. So it's a very complex disorder, a developmental disorder. It affects the brain's development. It affects these social and communication skills. And you'll, you'll notice these patients are um, a little bit difficult to handle depending on where on the spectrum they are. But there are these four areas as per the DSM-5. So there's autism, there's Asperger's, there's childhood pervasive, sorry, childhood disintegrative disorder, and then pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. And they will be on the spectrum. So from mild to severe. And remember that they will share some common features. So as I mentioned, they're socially you know, awkward. They don't interact well. Um, their communication, their verbal communication varies from being slightly verbal to completely non-verbal. And they have problems processing information. They often show these restrictive or repetitive kinds of behavior. And as I said, they do vary from being from uh, mild to severe. Right, so when we're looking at <clears throat> autism spectrum disorders, just like all the other ones, actually, I forgot to tell you that, is that these things very seldom occur in isolation. So you're going to have autism spectrum disorder combined with something like ADHD or combined with depression or combined with anxiety. None of these things are usually found completely in isolation. So like an ADHD child can be depressed or anxious or an ODD child can have um, anxiety and so on. So a lot of these, these disorders are linked to a greater or lesser extent. So just bear that in mind. I'm going to show you a video of a child or two, two different kinds of children to illustrate this range of the spectrum. So the first child that you're going to see here, he's got pretty um, low grade, um, you know, problems. He just likes writing numbers down repetitively. So it's pretty innocuous, very quiet. Uh, he writes, likes writing numbers down a lot, but you know, it's not, it's not the end of the world. So he can function, he can obviously read, he can communicate. He's just a little bit odd. Whereas if you go, to this child who's high on the autism spectrum disorder 
he really has a problem. So he, you can watch the video. He will self harm, can't speak, can't function, can't feed himself, um, has to be um, in, you know, in nappies all the time. So you can see it, it ranges. So from being sort of high functioning, just a little bit offish, to completely on the other side of the spectrum in terms of nonverbal, uh, very mentally challenged, self-harming, danger to themselves, and unable to care for themselves at all. So there's there's a whole range of children on these spectrums, and it will vary where they are as to how you're going to try and handle them. Okay, so these what happens with with the um, autism spectrum disorder is that the development is not normal. So it starts, or it might start off normally at first, and then somewhere between the age of three, sorry, in between the age of 18 and 36 months, but bef definitely before the age of three, the development stops and sometimes even regresses and plateaus. So generally these autistic behaviors manifest before the age of three but they're difficult to diagnose before then. And I'm going to talk to you about that a little bit later. So the incidence in America is about one in 68, and in South Africa, about one in 88. Um, children are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. It has been sort of a lot more common of late, but just bear in mind that the diagnostic criteria has changed, so more kids are showing up with that, and also people are more aware now. So whether there's an actual increase in the incidence more recently is, de is debatable. The cause of, of these autism spectrum disorders are really both genetic and environmental, can be both, but it's very important, and I can't reiterate this enough, is that there is no link between autism spectrum disorder and the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, or any vaccine for that matter. And don't let Karen on Facebook tell you otherwise, please, guys. Um, it's very important. There is no research to show any link between vaccination and a cause of autism. I cannot say that enough. There's no link between vaccination and autism. So for children not to be vaccinated because someone has read some way um, that it causes a problem is really, really wrong. And you have to put them right. You, I cannot tell you how important this is. Okay, let me now that I'm off my little high horse, let me just go over some of the signs and symptoms and stuff of autism. I'm sure you know about it. But these kids are, are socially, you know, quite strange. So they've got social and cognitive impairments and they have really got problems communicating and they have these weird repetitive behaviors, as I've said. They don't respond to their name often, which is quite strange and that is a bit irritating for the parents. They also won't point to objects of interest. It's like they're sort of outside their realm. They don't demonstrate interest They don't in, in things. They don't play pretend games very well. Everything is, is very sort of, you know, it has to be there and present for them to, to interact with it. They don't make eye contact, which the parents find very irritating. And this is one of the first signs that they will pick up on when the kids are a baby. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. They don't play well with others. They really prefer to be on their own. They don't understand or comprehend people's feelings and are quite surprised when people react strangely when they say stuff. So they, they, don't, they don't take other people's feelings into account. They're not empathetic at all. They often have no speech or delayed speech. They can repeat words. So they have this thing called echolalia. They'll often have a phrase or a word that they, that they repeat to themselves over and over. They will give weird answers, unrelated answers to a question. So they'll say, oh, hi, John, how are you? And they'll go, the bird is blue. And I go, what? Okay, it's got nothing to do with what we're talking about, but whatever it is. They will get very, very upset about minor changes. So, for example, they have a routine, and if that routine is interfered with, these kids go crazy. It was a case I was reading about. Um, the father was driving the child to school. Now, the kid was 16. He was in a special school, but he went 
to school at exactly the same time and the exactly the same route every day. So the one day the parent is the father's driving the child to school and there was roadworks and they had to they had to divert obviously to get to school and they went a different route. And this child, the boy, attacked the father while he was driving and caused a major accident. So and this kid big, I mean he's 16. So physically attacked the father, father had an accident, big story. They eventually had to modify the car and make it like one of those police cars that would have got the mesh so that the, the child couldn't reach the father in case that happened again. It was really quite bad. Um, so they don't like routine. They're very picky eaters as well. So for example, they'll only eat red viennas. And this causes a lot of trouble with digestive issues, weight problems, strange stuff. So either too much weight or overweight or too little weight. And um, it's very odd, but they don't like changing their routine. They go completely crazy. So they don't have very good social skills. They don't like being touched. So they don't like hugging. They don't like, you know, any physical contact at all, often. They're also completely unaware of danger. They will walk across the road going to look for the green wall that they saw right in front of a car. They also have weird ways of speaking. So they will speak about themselves in the third person. So they'll say, John wants an orange. And you're like, okay, it's a bit strange. Anywho, they can be hyperactive or hypoactive and very impulsive. They've got a short attention span often and can be quite aggressive as I've, as I've shown you on that other video. They can self-harm. Um, they can have really bad meltdowns. And I tell you, I had a child, it was very bad. I, was, I had a child I was examining and the mother was sitting with the other child in the waiting room and the, the child with the mom had really severe autism and completely lost it and went ballistic. It was causing such chaos that I had to cut the exam of the brother short and had to reschedule everything. So I think it was just because the, the child was brought with into the situation that they weren't comfortable with, but they can be very disruptive. So you've got to watch out for that. They have very weird moods and emotional reactions to stuff. So sometimes they'll lack fear completely and other times they'll be fearful of the weirdest things. So it's quite, it's quite odd. So don't, you know, don't judge them. They, they do their own thing. So when they're playing with toys, they'll play with toys really weirdly. So they'll play with a car, but they'll pack all the red cars together or they'll play with only the wheels of the car. So they have strange ways of, of doing things. And as I said, they've got very specific eating habits. Um, they, but the other thing is that they sometimes tend to chew on stuff, which is also weird. And it, it's really a bit odd. Anywho. So don't judge them. And it is a challenge. I really feel for these parents. And you guys remember that moving rain man, that is not autism. Okay, that can be a subset of autism called being a savant. But don't tell me that you know about autism if you've watched rain man. And the other thing is every autistic child is different. So if you've seen autistic children, you've seen one autistic child because what works for one is going to be completely different for what works for the other you're going to have to modify and adapt your stuff all the time it's a challenge i tell you right now don't think there's some kind of recipe book that you can that you can work with as i mentioned um the issue with diagnosis is that it has to happen before what usually happens by the before the age of three but the earlier that it can be diagnosed the better because the earlier intervention strategies that can be put in place make a huge impact as to how these kids can function later in life. So the issue is that because children are really non-verbal and can't communicate very well and don't have social interactions until they're sort of, you know, beyond two and can walk and talk, it leads to this not being diagnosed early enough. They do this, they do this thing called the MCHAT RF checklist. So it's a modified checklist for autism in toddlers um, revised with follow-up that is used by developmental pediatricians or pediatric neurologists or pediatric psychologists or psychiatrists. And it's done at a developmental level of 9, 18, and then 24 months. And it sort of gives you an idea of what's going on. But if we can diagnose this earlier, it's going to be better. 
And so what's happening is new research is just coming out to show that using eye movement, specifically using an eye movement, infrared eye movement tracker, um, you can diagnose autism earlier on. But that's another lecture for another day. So remember, though, that there is no cure for autism. So the treatments are all related to early interventions. So behavior and communication strategies, occupational speech therapies help a lot. Sensory integration therapy, um, picture systems and so on. But there's no real medication they can take that'll make it go away. The medication that's given is to really help with um, things like the ADD or the anxiety or the depression or whatever goes with that. So watch out for that. And there's some really dodgy stuff on the internet that can cause major damage. So remember, there's no actual cure for, for autism. All right. So the earlier we can diagnose it, the better. So remember, in terms of optometric examinations, how do we, con how do we handle these kids? Remember that the language is going to vary. So some can speak, but don't want to. Some can't speak at all and completely nonverbal. In that case, just treat the child as you would um, a, a baby that can't verbalize or a, a pe person that's unable to speak, whatever it is. So don't ask a lot of questions though. Don't ask stacking questions. In other words, when you're sitting watching the board, do you find that it's blurry and can you read clearly at me? Da, da, da. No, no, just one thing at a time, very slowly. Not too loud, quiet environment, using verbal uh, non-verbal cues helps a lot so in other words you know point at stuff and ask them to read it instead of asking them lots of lots of stacking questions stay calm uh, it makes it makes your life much easier so they will have some weird inappropriate behaviors as i said they often you know do repetitive kind of stuff they have the echolalia thing going you don't go don't say oh, sit still or stop saying that or whatever it is just look past that inappropriate behavior and deal with what you can empathize with it you know and just just carry on so you have to observe them first see how you're going to handle it because it's a little bit difficult you you're not going to know how to handle a child um, if you don't know what they can and they can't do so you can ask the parents it'll help a lot and then approach them you know build on what they can do build on their interests if you see that they like the car use that you know or the, the color red or whatever it is it just try and respond appropriately and use the child's responses and their tone to try and get them to work with you sometimes it's difficult but you're gonna to have to adjust your your treat your the way you assess and treat them all the time and remember different for different kids okay so once you get a response expand on that in other words if you're going somewhere with something and you're getting them to feed back to you use that for other tests don't go down a path when they're not actually responding to anything. Okay, sometimes you're busy with these kids and they really just lose it. So at that point, what do you do? You can't reason with these kids. They're gonna have a meltdown sometimes. That's just how it is. Or they're gonna react completely inappropriately and start screaming. Just stop, stop whatever it is you're doing. Try and just disengage from that situation. So reduce the stimulation. Don't try and shout at the child. Don't try and teach them a lesson. Don't say, you know, it's your fault, blah. Just give them space. Sometimes I just go out of the consulting room completely. Let the parent try and handle the child and give them some space and time to calm down. If it doesn't work, that's fine. Just stop. Stop at a point where it's not traumatic for the child. And oftentimes, as I said, with all of these kids, you have to get them back. So if they're becoming completely dysregulated, stop your examination and reschedule doesn't help you you're not going to get anywhere if the kid has completely lost it and is having a meltdown so just move on okay so autism to special needs kids these kids are very 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 sweet and i mean they'll range from everything from kids with cp to learning disabilities to you know mental retardation whatever it is there's a whole range of special needs kids and they're actually quite sweet. This little noodle, oh, she's the sweetest little thing. So she's got CP and she's had some other issues. She's got major visual problems. She's got the cutest little pink wheelchair that's got sparkly lights on the wheels and stuff. And she really is nice. And quite responsive. 
but not very verbal and you know you've got to deal with with this kind of thing and just modify your exam every child is going to be different what works for her is not going to work for the next one so oftentimes these poor children are defined by what they can't do so okay they can't walk so you know what so they can't talk so we'll move on it really varies a lot from a mild kind of learning disability to really badly cognitively impaired and you're just going to have to modify your examination as you go on so they all have an issue with developmental delays and also these kids sometimes will have bits of panic attacks and some kind of behavioral problems you're going to have to deal with right so when we're dealing with kids with special needs oftentimes there's going to be poor cooperation they're going to be emotionally outbursts the language is going to be bad or non-existent they often won't be able to pay attention visually for a long time like if you've got a child with cvi or some such thing they can't attend visually very well i uh, saw a little girl the other day two years four months old cvi you have to just deal with it and try and do what you can and modify it all the time and make sure you, you get the kid as comfortable as possible. So they often have bad posture because, especially with CP, for example, they have contractions of their muscles and weird head tilts and things like that, and they can't walk, or they've got bad motor skills, or they might be hyper and hyper responsive to some kind of stimuli. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna sit in the situation, you're only gonna be able to do some stuff, not all the stuff, not do all the stuff, normally the way you would normally do it on other kids and then you're going to have to just extrapolate all that information somehow and make a decision and have a treatment plan so remember oftentimes you're going to be dealing with less than perfect information and not enough of it it is your skill that's going to determine how you how you use it but don't think that you're going to follow your nice little 21 point test and it's going to work you're going to have to modify things as you go along it's fun but it is challenging. So as I'm saying with all of these kids, is the environment that they find themselves in is very important. You have to gain their trust and go slowly, work slowly, make sure, especially with these special needs kids and the CP kids or the kids that are in wheelchairs and stuff, that they feel that they are comfortable. If they feel that they're going to fall um, or that they're not sort of engaged in terms of the way they're able to sit and react, they're not gonna respond properly. So don't take the child out the wheelchair into your high chair and sort of move it up all the way to the ceiling. They're gonna get very, very, very scared of that. So what I do is I leave the kids in their wheelchair if they are in their wheelchair. If they are able to or they prefer to sit on the floor, do that. Get on the floor, get out the chair. Use stuff, make it fun for them. Start with something they can do. So for example, these, these kinds of chairs, the kids that are very um, unstable in terms of their physical movements like these, they can sit in there, they can feel safe, they can feel comfy, you can get down, you can do a whole lot of stuff with them on that kind of chair. So if they have those, bring that with, otherwise get one for the practice, they work really, really well for these kids and get out, the, get out of the consulting room chair, get onto the floor or leave the kid in the wheelchair, just modify what you have to do. You cannot be using a furopter with these children. It's not gonna work. They're gonna hate it. You're not gonna see what's going on. Oftentimes because of the, the um, muscular spasms and stuff in specifically CP kids, they can't sit behind a furopter. So you can't have them there, so stop it. Don't even think about it. Um, it also helps you to have observation of what's going on. And it's less intimidating for them. They can see their mom. They can be happy. Their body can be in their normal posture. They can have their normal head movement. They can have their eye movement. You can also see what is their head posture, how, what's going to work. You can't put them by the phoropter if they've got a head tilt, for example. So there's no recipe book for this, guys. Unfortunately, it's just going to be fly by the seat of your pants. Fun, fun, fun. Okay. So as I said, each child is unique. Watch what they can do. Look for their behavior and ask the mother. You know, the mother spends the time with the, with the child. They know what they can and can't do. They know what stresses them out. They know what they like, what they don't like. Um, and just remember, try and keep things really quiet and calm. So don't touch them too much. Don't make too much noise. No sudden movements, no bright lights. It's going to cause anxiety. So you're going to have to just be a little bit creative as you go along. Okay. 
just want to mention specifically with visual acuities in these special needs kids, do it binocularly first. Two reasons, it gives you an idea of what the child's visual ability is in their normal situation. Secondly, it's not so stressful for the kid because they don't like having their eyes occluded. Okay, so they're tactually quite defensive. They don't like having stuff covered up. Um, and it, give, it just gives you an idea of what's going on. So do it binocularly. And remember, you're going to have to pick a test according to what the child's ability is. So for example, if a child is completely non-verbal, it doesn't help like you sit in there going, okay, read the bottom line of the child, thank you, and then they can't. So if they can do pictures, great. If they can't, you know, they can try to do the pointing comparison ones. If they can't do that, well, then you just do an okay in drum kind of thing. Just do whatever it is that that child is capable of. And also, um, you know, it makes it easier for them if they can start binocularly. This thing about trying to get children into autorefract, normal autorefract is a normal automated equipment freaks me out. Unless you're prepared to strap the child in with duct tape, like I had on my other, my other video, um, which is never a good idea by the way, it's gonna be very difficult. So don't use these automated equipment things at the beginning of the exam, they're quite intimidating. Try and demonstrate them first if you are going to try and use them and if you think that the patient can do it, but really, what I'm trying to say is you're going to have to modify your equipment a little bit. So handheld ultrafractors, handheld slit lamps, things like that are going to be better. Um, don't, uh, don't think they're going to fit into those instruments. If they're sitting in a small wheelchair, it's going to be very difficult to get them behind a slit lamp, right? So you're going to have to modify what it is you're doing. But I don't, I don't like using normal ultrafractors on children anyway. So I find the readings are a bit odd and tend to get much more myopia due to the instrument myopia thing and accommodation that's not controlled for. So watch out for that. Okay, so those were special, special needs kits. Modify, adapt, work on the floor, stay out of normal instruments, etc. Let's look at some precocious kids. So precocious kids are kids that are sort of like 11 going on 35. They know everything, they've been there, done that, you know, you'll swear they've got a lifetime's worth of of experience. So they, Afrikaans people call them furupivar, right? They know everything and you know, you're just the silly optometrist. And that's fine, but these kids are usually quite bright. So it's important not to talk down to them. They, they really don't like that very much. So you can use adult charts with them. If they can read, go for it. You know, that's fine. You know these things. We're not going to use kiddie stuff on you. We're going to do the same tests that we do on adults. That's fine. And they quite like having explained what's going on. So you say, oh, I'm going to uh, check your eye movements now. We're going to see if all the little muscles in your eyes are working, blah, blah. That'll be great. They understand that. But these are the kids that often malinger. They want a pair of specs for whatever reason. I don't care. Um, you know, they're going to be the ones that are going to have these weird reactions when you're trying to get a VA, and they think they're being very clever, but not really. So use your tricks. I mean, you have these kids that say, oh, I can't read, I can't see the board, blah, blah. And then you cover one eye, and it's like, oh, it's like the biggest E, and they're going like, oh, Z. And it doesn't matter. You get them off the chair, move them closer to the chart, and it's like, oh, I can't see it. Meanwhile, you've seen them sitting, coloring in, and doing a dot-to-dot -dot puzzle or Sudoku in the waiting room. So you know what I'm saying. Um, but use your tricks, planolin, stacking, whatever it is. You know, you can you can actually figure it out and, and find methods to do that. So important with these children though is don't call them out in front of their parents. In other words, if you have found that they're malingering, don't say, yeah, I got you. You know, you little such and such, blah, blah. Um, you can speak to the parents about it later, explain the thing. So they're going to challenge you, but you know what? You know more than they do, hopefully. Uh, so yeah, watch out for these kids. They can be a bit of a they can be a bit of a pain, but you know what you're doing. Okay. Right. Last group of kids, and these they are out there. Sorry for the Afrikaans, but stotrat just means really plain naughty. And yes, not every child who's behaving badly has got some kind of disorder. Oh, shame, Freddie is dysregulated. No, Freddie is just a naughty little such and such sometimes. And that's what kids do, right? And they are out there. We've seen them. I had the, this one child sitting in my waiting room, literally taking a crayon, 
going to my beautiful velvet little hand shaped chair and scribbling all over it and the parents were sitting on the couch next to him just watching him do it i'm like really and so i sent them a bill for three and a half thousand rand for damaging my chair and they were very upset and i'm like i saw you sitting there just watching your child you know when i went back on the cctv what is wrong with you so yes naughty 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 and they're out there you can see them and they're going to freak you out but very important when you are seeing these kids don't discipline them as much as you'd like to do not scream and shout do not grab them do not certainly don't touch them you're going to be in big trouble okay you need to call out the parents which sometimes they don't like but you know um that is what it is um easiest way is just charging for damage so when they do silly stuff that's how it's going to go so like okay if you continue swinging on my slit limb i'm going to charge you for that if they're completely out of control you know what you are well within your rights there's no reason you have to be abused um you're well within your rights to reschedule these kids and just charge for your time i really feel sorry for teachers i have to be honest for you with you that i hope that parents who are now having to spend all day with their kids at home during COVID get a feel for what it is that the teachers go through because the parents some parents seem to think that it's the teacher's job to discipline educate and do everything with the, with the kids. No, that discipline starts at home. That education starts at home. It is your job. You, it's your child. You wanted them. I suggest you take some responsibility. And there are just some parents who don't care and can be really, really horrid. So uh, maybe now that COVID has happened and they'd have to, they've had to spend some time with these kids, and they can feel what it feels like. But yeah, there are, there are naughty kids out there and you've seen them you know what you don't need to take it they can come back and yeah that's what it is so remember guys it's tough out there it's not easy this is not for everybody if you want to do it it's going to be very rewarding if you don't want to do it and you like everything to go according to a recipe book which i can't give you then it's going to be a challenge so remember these are my motto this is my motto drink your coffee stay focused don't freak out stabbing people is wrong and especially now in the time of Zoom and COVID, look down, are you wearing pants? So good luck, guys. I wish you luck out there. And um, yes, it's, it's going to be fun. Okay, so where are we? That's it for now. Hopefully that was interesting. Um, yeah, questions, anything like that, put them in the chat box. I'm happy to help. And mm, good luck. Guys, I hope this thing comes to an end soon, although I think it's going to be with us for a very, very long time. Do what you can, stay safe, stay sane, and yeah, bye.